Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Well, I'm going to bring Dan Jurgens on. Uh, John, do yourself a favor. Try to figure out what's going on with your mic there, and we will bring you right back. Dan, thank you so much for joining us here on Mainframe Comic Con. Sorry about the technical difficulties. No problem, Drew. Really. Happy have, to be here. You have an underprepared moderator as well. <laughs> as uh, as a, a, And uh, John, I'm sure, had some uh, very poignant questions ready for you. Uh, all my questions are probably going to be uh, Death of Superman related. Uh <laughs> You, you come up with a couple of them, and we can certainly uh, fly and make something happen here. No problem. Well, first thing I want to ask you, Dan, uh, is is what are you currently working on? What project are you working on right now that you're excited about? These days, we've got a couple of things. Uh, currently, I'm writing both Nightwing and Batman Beyond for DC Comics. Uh, with Batman Beyond, we're building up to issue 50. With Nightwing, which has been... Um, in a cycle where Dick Grayson has amnesia and has not known who he is now for almost two years, I believe, uh, is finally building through the Joker War, which is appearing in the Batman titles, to a reconciliation of all that in Nightwing number 75. And in addition to those two things, I just wrote and drew uh, a Batman story for Detective Comics number 1027, which celebrates you know 1,000 issues since Batman first appeared. Uh, which is gorgeously inked by Kevin Nolan. Uh, and I think that may come out uh, next month. And so, and that also sets up something else that is going to spring off from there. So that's what I have going on these days. That's fantastic. I've actually been up and down myself reading that Nightwing book. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big Dick Grayson fan. And I felt like uh, initially, I was like kind of a slap in the face of fans take get give me Rick Grayson. I, I don't want that. But there's actually been a really lot of a lot of great storytelling in there. And uh, I, I love when when taking the time to actually read something that initially doesn't uh, suit my taste, uh, turn turns a corner and, and I start to enjoy it. Um, yeah. I, and, I, I, and I think, um, Drew, that one of the things that happened, like, you know, when I came on to the book, <clears throat> they were already in that storyline and Dick had the amnesia and was living in Blue Haven as Rick Grayson. And I, they said, do you want to do this? And I said, well, let me look at it and see if I can possibly find something to make it work. And I think one of the things that had happened is that when the storyline launched, you had Dick with amnesia, you had four other people wanting to be Nightwing, and there was a lack of connection a little bit through the story. So one of the things we did is to say there was a specific reason that Dick has amnesia, and it's because the Court of Vowels was involved in all of this. And and they uh, planted uh, by getting their own therapist in to treat Dick this um, almost hypnotic effect that gave him the amnesia. And by building them into the storyline and bringing Talon into it, which he is obviously connected to the Grayson family, I think we were able to kind of take some lemons and make lemonade out of it and really start to build something that is more of a true Nightwing story. And I think ultimately what people do want is whether you call him Dick Grayson or Rick Grayson or Richard Grayson or anybody else, you want a Nightwing type of story. That's awesome. Uh, and, and a really great way to service the fans while still uh, exploring some new territory. Uh, it looks like John's back. We're going to see if we can get him back. But I have one more okay. question for you before he hops in here. Um, I'm such a big fan of the work you did uh, back during the era of uh, you know, the reign of the Superman and and death of Superman. Um, and I'm just curious as to if you saw those those threads from those story arcs lasting as long through DC continuity as they have. It's uh, is is did you see Doomsday being kind of a long long term player? I know when the New 52 rolled around, it gave you gave everybody a chance to kind of play in that sandbox again. Um, when you were writing those stories and, and, and breaking those stories, did you see that as something that was going to uh, be kind of a, a long-term uh, set of players in the Superman mythos? No, Drew. I mean, when you're in the midst of a story, you are really in the moment. And, and a lot of it is what you're what I was trying to do, and I think most creators fit this profile, you're just trying to tell the best story you can, 
meet the deadlines. And, and especially when you get to the point where you know the whole world is watching what you're doing and the book is going to sell that much and there will be that many people reading it, you really want to deliver in a big way and make it work at that moment. So that's November of 1992 that Death of Superman came out. So then do you ever possibly foresee the day when you'll see Doomsday on the movie screen and you'll see a couple of animated versions of the Death of Superman and it'll live on in all these different uh, sort of versions with action figures. I mean, at this point, it's one of the most iconic stories in the history of, you know, over 80 years of Superman history. I take comic history. And, but yeah, yeah, there's no way you can see it coming. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed, I'm going to try to pull John back in here right now, but before I do, I want to let you know I really enjoyed uh, what you did with action comics and pulling all those threads together in, in the Rebirth run. I really, really enjoyed that stuff. So, John... Yeah. Thank You're you. on mute via StreamYard. If we can unmute there, your StreamYard. You're yeah. You're still on mute. No, now I'm fine. There hey, hey, hey. <laughs> All right. Was I apologize. Drive along and let you pretty people talk. A yeoman effort, Drew. Thank you so much. And Dan, it is great to see you. And I heard you uh, talking with Drew about Death of Superman. And we'll uh, remind our viewers that not only do you have a spotlight happening now. But uh, in about 90 minutes, you'll be back with uh, other great Superman writers. So we'll be talking a lot of Superman. Uh, right. Good morning, John. Good, good morning, morning, Dan. It's, yes. It is good to see you. One of my favorite uh, pieces behind you, a great collaboration you did with Alex Ross. Oh, yeah. And, For the uh, uh, Superman Fantastic Four team up that we did back when we could do those things and have a lot of fun with them. Yes. Ah, uh, you know, the days without politics, I, I understand. Absolutely. <laughs> so it was, it was a more um, benign time for sure. Absolutely. Dan, you, uh, you know, we, we just talked a few weeks ago on Word Balloon and uh, beyond the Superman stuff, you are all over uh, the Batman world. Uh, really, as I, as I uh, phrased our uh, conversation, the sons of Batman, if you will. Yes. Uh, yeah. Dick Grayson, uh, Nightwing and, um, and uh, Batman Beyond. And then currently uh, Terry McGinnis, teaming up with Damian Wayne in the future. So some really great stories about the Sons of Batman. Yeah, it's uh, certainly pushing that one forward. And I think part of the fun with Batman Beyond, of course, and I assume everyone is familiar with the cartoon. And so it takes place roughly somewhere between 30 and 40 years from now. And to be able to play with these characters in the future, whether it's Bruce Wayne, whether it's Damian, who say at that point, 40, 45 years old, something like that. Uh, but to Barbara Gordon, to have all these characters available and play with them down the road is a lot of fun. Uh, we had um, certainly Barry Allen as Flash show up recently, and that was fun. And so in addition, uh, we're finally going to get to do a story that I've been wanting to do for quite some time, wherein we get a little bit of a time travel play going. And we have Booster Gold show up in the, in the world of Batman Beyond in the future and say, Booster, I've got to bring you back to the present. So that gives us the potential of a much younger Bruce Wayne and Terry McGinnis meeting. So we, we have that story coming up in uh, 48 and 49. And I think people are really going to like that one. That's a lot of fun. And also you're participating in the Joker War. And certainly yeah. Dick Grayson has got his hands full and a very interesting wrinkle because both uh, Dick Grayson and the Joker are able to push each other's buttons in a way that it's a different relationship than the, the Batman uh, Joker dynamic. Absolutely. And, you know, part of it is that, and, and Drew and I had touched on the idea that Nightwing through as Dick Grayson had had amnesia and had become known as Rick Grayson. And it all swirls around uh, sort of a, a hypnotic crystal that the court of owls used on Dick Grayson after he got shot. What we have done is since let the Joker get his hands on that, and uh, who is now hypnotized, if you will, um, <clears throat> Rick Grayson into really thinking that he's the Joker's son. And in his mind, the Joker replaced the role of Bruce Wayne and Batman. And Joker calls him Dicky Boy. And it's just this sort of different look at things a little bit and it allows us to do some different things with Dick's character, uh, write his dialogue differently, which is a lot of fun and play into everything that James Tynan has set up so well as part of the Joker War and the Batman title. Absolutely, man. And also, as you explore all three of these guys right now, they're all asking that question, who am I? I mean, even Damien right now facing a threat within the League of Assassins. And I love the idea that in the future, 
he's uh, running uh, his grandfather's uh, empire and his mother's empire. And, right. uh, and, and, you know, and, and also again, um, I think uh, obviously Dick under the, uh, the uh, power of the Joker right now, his history being rewritten and also just coming off of that terrible amnesia that he suffered at the hands of the court of Owls. It's uh it's, it's really interesting. And I think uh, you really get inside in a different way of these guys. Yeah. Thanks. And it's been uh, certainly a lot of fun. And, um, I had mentioned this earlier, but when I, Nightwing was already into this storyline when I came on the book and started. And, and so it was um, kind of a, a almost problem solving technique of what can I do, take this on and bring more elements into it to make it a true Nightwing book. And I think even in Batman Beyond, where we're dealing with uh, Damian Wayne, you ask the question, who is he really, uh, especially once he gets to be about 40, 45 years of age? Is he yeah. more his mother's son or his father's son? And I don't think those answers are necessarily as easy to come by as one might think. I mean, obviously, uh, you you have this phase where all children sort of want to break away from their parents. And, and so then it can become very natural for Damien to want to inherit his grandfather's legacy. Understood. Absolutely, man. No, I think, again... Dan, you always bring an interesting voice to, to these characters, but in both companies, DC and Marvel, your great runs on Thor, Captain America. And in fact, I, I do want to open it up to any questions beyond uh, what we're currently talking about and uh, remind people too, you can see the crawl underneath the ethos, uh, donate to the Hero Initiative, heroinitiative.org. Or if you're watching on uh, Mainframe Comic Con's uh, main page, click on the donate button there. It's a great cause. And you know, as Dan knows, they make most of their money through uh, conventions, live live events. Right. So literally their fundraising is like lower than 90, 90%, around 80, like 80% of what they would be making. They're not right now. So that's why we're happy to help out with Mainframe and we hope you will uh, donate to that. Yeah, and we have tried to step in in any number of ways. And, and I think obviously all of us in this industry are trying to adapt to a world in which we don't have connections or conventions rather, and find a way to make that same connection that you can at a convention where if we're there signing as part of the hero initiative or sketching or something like that, people are, are so willing to step up with their time, with their money. And that's what we're hoping we can get them to do here as well. Amen, buddy. And I know uh, I'm assuming that you've got some stuff coming up at, um, at uh, DC Fandom next weekend as well. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. In fact, uh, have a, a nice little interview with uh, kind of touching on Superman with that uh, Brian Bendis and um, Jean Lun Yang and I all did together. And that, that was a lot of fun. So I think, uh, I, I think people will enjoy that one for sure. Absolutely, man. I was talking to Brian about it last night on our, uh, oh. our preview show for Mainframe, and he's he's really jazzed to talk about it. And I'm sure Gene was as well. You know, yeah. Dan, you started literally, and, I, and I'm not being nice when I say this, you started so young breaking into DC. Uh, yeah, I think and, it was and, four. <laughs> <laughs> I love your work, especially when it was written on Grant or in Grant. Um, yeah. No, but honestly, man, it's been so great to have you uh, be part of uh, the DC universe for as long as you have, man. And again, uh, just not only, of course, creating Booster Gold and uh, Justice League International and so many other great runs over the years. And it's it's terrific that, you know, clearly the, the well isn't empty, man. You keep finding new things to say about these incredible characters. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the, the things that's really mandatory when you do something like this is all of us as writers, I think, get to a point where we make a certain connection with characters that sort of supersedes the one you make with everybody else. I mean, I think anytime you're writing a book or working on a character, it has to be your most important thing that you're doing at that time and in that moment. But I think when you're truly fortunate, you establish a connection with a character that carries beyond that. And when that happens, I think you can always find new story material for that character, especially because as the world changes around us, you know, it, it allows different ideas and different topics to come in and play for that character. And, and I think that's true of Superman. I think it would be true of Booster Gold. I think it would be true for just about any character I've worked on that how does that character change in the world today? Or how does the perception of that character change in that world today if 
they really existed and things like that. And I think that's how you make that work. You're in Minnesota and certainly the idea of the police's role in society has come up in the real world. Does that in, uh, you know, kind of also in, you know, influence possible ideas for stories? I mean, are they, I mean, cause I know for, for a couple of years, even Superman, uh, the truth justice in the American way thing was kind of questioned or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, vigilantism, you know, I mean, are, are those are those themes in in your your story? I mean, they're always in your stories, but I mean, with with what's happening societally, uh, you know, is that an influence? I think anything like that becomes an influence. You know, we um, a number of years ago, when when I was working on Superman during my first tenure on it, uh, we all sat in a room one time and and discussed this idea of do we say. Uh, truth, justice in the American way, or do we just say truth and justice? Because even then, it was fair to ask, what does the American way mean, and does it have different meaning to everybody else? Uh, or does it have the same meaning to everyone, is really what we were playing with. And so I think that was a fair question to ask at that time. I think it's a fair question to ask today. And if Superman is going to say that, then what is that saying about the character of Superman? in this moment. So I think that's always fair game. I, I think you always have to ask those questions about a character when you're working on them. Because again, the world outside my window in 2020 is not the same as it was in 1990 or 1970 or anything else. So you always have to take new measure of these things. Understood, man. Yeah. And I guess to, uh, you know, God, again, you're great run on Captain America. I mean, that's the thing. These, ca these characters were created at a very crucial time. And I think uh, did represent Amer American values of a certain time, but you know, yeah, this this pendulum does swing back and forth, and it, it's a fair question. I mean, you know, good lord, I'm wondering what the, they're going to do with John Walker and the American Agent, uh, oh, the yeah. US Agent. You know, <laughs> while while this again, these are these are interesting characters. Guy Gardner certainly. You know, um, what? Uh, yeah, what else? What else can you tell us about uh, possible future uh, plans for uh, for Nightwing and, uh, and 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 Terry? Well, really, for um, for both books, uh, we're building up to the point where uh, we have a fun story in Batman Beyond coming up. Like I said, where Booster Gold shows up in the yep. world of the future and says, you know, I've got to bring you to the past. <laughs> um, and then it is, well, what happens if Terry and young Bruce meet? And then what does that do to change the future? That, that kind of thing. Uh, then and obviously with Nightwing, as part of the Joker War, as we build to this uh, point of reconciliation, you know, how do you handle that? And one of the things that becomes, I think, very important is, you know, what happens to Rick if he gets his memory back and then really finds out about Alfred? Because as he has had amnesia, you know, Alfred's death is something that would have impacted him greatly. And, and he sort of missed out on that. So I think uh, the beauty of it is we have a tremendous amount of story we can play with there and work into the story as we kind of bring it to a close. That's excellent. Let's talk about the death of Alfred for a second. Is sure. that an opportunity? Do you, did you see that as an opportunity? Or, I mean, really, how much of it was in the room and discussed with all the, the bad office in general? Uh, that was, you know, I was not in the room, so I can only speak from my own perspective. And, and I know that kind of came down and... Uh, you know, they, they called me up and said, well, here's what's happening. And I said, well, yeah, but right now, if someone walked up to Rick Grayson and said, Alfred just died, he'd go, oh, yeah, the guy who came to see me once. You know, he would have that. He would have no emotional connection to it. So I think something like that, John, always gives you opportunity as a writer. And I, and I think, you know, that's where you have to find, OK, if that is the situation, how does that affect the character? What can we say about the character with that? How would we handle that? And the moment he finds out, what would that be? Um, what was Dick Grayson's true relationship with Alfred, who in many ways raised him more than Bruce did? So, yes, absolutely. When there is something like that on the table, there is opportunity in that. And that's when you get to find out more about the character that you're working on. See, and again, that shows your ability to adapt and move forward with these characters because, you know, truly, again, I mean, you were doing things before uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, for gosh sakes, and it's it's great to see that, again, that you've got these fresh ideas and that there's 
There's no uh, the, the, the well. Like I said, the da- gas tank's full, man. As far as Dan Jerkins goes, I, I think I like it's to great. think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, man. This yeah. is great. And now I know um, again based on our other conversation. Uh, Nightwing seventy five. Is that where you leaving? When, yeah. When leaving? Yep. Okay. Batman Beyond. You staying on for the long haul? What's uh, what's going on with that Batman Beyond? Uh, Batman Beyond. I'm just trying to get through to number fifty right now because I, again, it's. Uh, that's going to be, um, I hope a very special little story that we get to at that point. And I think that in this current, um, world that we live in, you know, producing comics right now, as it has been for everybody these past few months in this COVID-19 world has become a very different sort of thing. So to, to work through all of this, sometimes John, it really is, uh, the practical ability to produce comics and keeping the trains running on time, if you will, that's not been easy these past few months. There have been a lot of difficulties, but we're going to do that. I can appreciate that, man. C. Woodward is, uh, or Woodard, excuse me, 19 is on the chat and has a great comment. Cause really we've been talking about your writing. We haven't talked about your art. Dan mm-hmm. is my personal favorite Superman artist. His style, in my opinion, defines the character. Does Dan have a favorite Superman artist he either worked with or t- took inspiration from? Oh, wow. Well, okay. So the, the best way I can explain that one is um, fairly early uh, in my time at DC. So I think this must have been like late 1982, early 83, something like that. Um, I was drawing Warlord and I wanted to do some superhero stuff. And I was kind of asking about it. And at that time, Karen Berger, who would later go on to do really incredible things with Vertigo, and you know, editing Legion of Superheroes and things like that. She was editorial coordinator and she asked me, you know, can you draw Superman? And I said, no, Kurt Swan, he's the only one who can draw Superman. So I, I start with that. And, and it was because as a kid, Kurt Swan really uh, was the visual um, determinator of what Superman would look like. He created the iconography that was so much about Superman, the classic shots, that look, uh, kind of a sense of regal majesty and everything. So, yeah, my answer to that would be, uh, as a kid, it started with Kurt Swan, and I still look at it that way today. That's awesome. And uh, that's so funny because I know for older readers, the question is, Kurt Swan or Wayne Boring? But I'm with you when it comes to Kurt Swan. Um, So many covers beyond the interiors that he did as well. And just really was the, the signature Superman artist for such a long time. So, no, I know exactly what you mean, man. Yeah, and taking was, nothing away from Wayne Boring, who was a great. No, artist. no, not at all. And and I look at Boring stuff now, and and I have a great amount of appreciation for it. And I would also add Al Plastino to the mix. And obviously, you have to start with Joe Schuster. So of course, uh, it's always interesting to look back on it. You know, whereas Batman has had, I think, so many different visual interpretations and artists that sort of ring true on it. When you get down to it, Superman has a much smaller bunch, at least to me, he does. And and I think where it's easier to kind of trace the evolution, uh, the visual evolution of the character over time since day one. The design hasn't changed much in the case of Superman compared to Batman. So right. many have tweaked the costume with Batman. And all this Superman chat obviously will continue in about an hour or so when we talk about 50 years of Superman with yourself, Jerry Ordway, Elliot Magan, and Paul Kupperberg, four right. people that really put their imprint on Superman in their writing, and certainly you with your writing and your art. Um, man, I'll tell you, dude, I, I, again, I, I think your years in the Superman office uh, during the Doomsday period was was incredible, and I look forward to talking to you and Jerry about that as well. Yeah, it and, should be a lot uh, of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So that's going to be terrific, and we've got a ton of other great panels happening here at uh, – at Mainframe Comic Con, I'll be talking in a couple of minutes with the AWA crime uh, creators. They're all backstage right, right now, ready to go on. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Um, Dan, I'll tell you, I, I really I miss you on the Justice League. It's funny you mentioned Karen's association with the Legion. That's a group I'd love to see you write or draw someday. Well, you know, it's it's weird because so way back when in the in the eighties, there was a time when um, DC went to what they called the hardcover soft cover program. You probably remember that and. Uh, uh, Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen were doing the hardcover sort of Baxter book version of the Legion. And Paul and I did the softcover version. And so I spent a year on the Legion back then, really had a lot of fun with it. And, um, okay. I that. yeah, 
Yeah, man. Okay. Well, and in many ways, that was sort of the golden age of the Legion of Superheroes as well. So, uh, you know, Paul, what the work that Paul and Keith did was just fantastic for a period of years that just breathed such incredible life into that team. Agreed. And people are commenting on our uh Wayne Boring, Kurt Swan uh, conversation. Comic Core themselves say, love Kurt Swan, Superman. And uh, Wayne Mousseau points out, you can't be Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson on Superman. I'll even throw, I have a page of uh, Kurt Swan, Tex Blaisdell. Oh, and really? that was a good okay. combination yeah. as well. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm a little more partial to Kurt Swan and George Klein myself, but that's just it. Yeah, everybody has their favorites uh, for whatever reason. So, and they're all good. And Kurt and Murphy together were just, spectacular the Swanderson team but yeah I'm a little partial to uh, George Klein that's awesome and I love even going back to the golden age and people like Wynn Mortimer I thought was a tremendous Superman artist as well so yeah and that's that's why I brought up Al Plastino who did um, far more work I think on Superman than most people realize and it's just such um, incredible stuff that again it all added to this magnificent tapestry that is the world of Superman. Agreed. Uh, you know, I'm going to, and I'll, I'll mention a guy that really drew Supergirl, Jim Mooney. Oh, yeah. I was like, when I, and obviously Superman was always a guest star and things. So this is great. This will uh, continue in our conversation uh, in about an hour when we celebrate 50 years of Superman with all of you guys. And I'm going to hold back on some other great uh, creators. And, and, and I really would love to hear when we have more time in the next hour, about encounters with some of those great classic Superman creators. Oh, by all means, yes. Excellent. That's all coming up in about an hour. And uh, Dan, I apologize that uh, my technology failed. This is how things are. This wouldn't happen. I could shout if we were live at a a convention (laughs) panel. Well, we bounced back, so we we made it work. And Drew, and yeah, Drew, yeoman effort, man. Thanks for stepping in until my uh, my tech stuff cleared up. But uh, truly, Dan, as always, Wonderful to talk to you. We'll pick up the conversation in about an hour right here in Hall C, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. John here from Word Balloon. Can uh, Drew, can they hear me okay, Drew? Lovely. Good to see you. Excellent. Apologies for the technical difficulties, but uh, I think I've got everything reasonably under control uh, and uh, reminding you that there's a lot of great uh, – work uh, happening in panels here at Mainframe Comic Con. Please support the Hero Initiative. Uh, do what you can to uh, support this great cause. I mentioned it earlier with Dan Jurgens when we had our spotlight panel that uh, unfortunately uh, Hero Initiative normally would be at uh, conventions live. And that's where they get uh, the bulk, like 80, 80 plus percent of their donations come from live events. Well, that's been taken away from them this year. So they really do need your help. So please consider going to HeroInitiative.org. If you're watching on uh, Mainframe Comic Con, there's a donate button right below us. Uh, please hit it. And, uh, you know, it's a great way of showing appreciation, not only for the great uh, freelancers of the past, but also uh, the, the current uh, crop that are uh, still entertaining us today. And uh, the group that we're about to talk to are certainly no exception. We're going to be talking about uh, 50 years of uh, Superman uh, writers panels uh, with uh, some incredible uh, creators that are waiting for us now. We've got a couple that are still hopefully going to join us, but in the meantime, let's bring in who we've got right now, Paul Kupperberg, everybody. Paul uh, has been working at, uh, well, man, he goes back to Charlton Comics back in the day, and uh, great to see you, Paul. Good to see you. Absolutely, and uh, you know, among your Superman work, of course, uh, you did the the World of Krypton miniseries, DC's first miniseries, and uh, and also uh, working on DC Presents, which was the Superman version of Brave and Bold, essentially, the right. Superman came up book, correct? Among right. other great things. And uh, let's also bring in, again, from uh, earlier, our current champion. Uh, it's like a game show. Dan Jurgens, everybody, who's been uh, writing Superman himself for uh, for the last 30 years and responsible for so many great uh, runs of creating Doomsday and certainly the death of Superman among uh, your, your achievements, all the way up to handing off uh, UNP Tomasi, handing things off to Brian Bendis. Just uh, just a couple of years ago, right? So it's great to see both of you, and hopefully joining us later will be uh, Jerry Ordway and uh, Elliot S. Magan, uh, because I, I really want to talk about the breadth of uh, the and the history of the character. So, Paul, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you because um, I you know I'm the you, oldest. Yeah, well, there you go. And yeah, you started writing Superman a couple of years before Dan and stuff. Oh, and I see our guys yeah. uh, starting to come in. So, uh, and uh, we'll and we will still talk to Paul, but uh, we will welcome Jerry Ordway to the conversation as well. It's great to see you, Jerry. Hello there. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Absolutely. Um, 
and yeah, so Paul, uh, tell us about uh, you know getting the gig and uh, and the opportunity to write Superman. When did it start for you? Um, well, I think it really started with uh, He-Man and the Masters of the, of the Universe. Um, the DC got the license to do the first comic book uh, adaptation of He-Man in, I guess it was 83 or so. And um, uh, uh, Dave Manick was an editor at the time, uh, and, uh, and he was given the assignment of editing the Masters of the Universe miniseries. Uh, but bef even before the miniseries kicked off, there were going to be uh, a 16-page um, uh, insert in all the DC Comics that month and uh, an appearance in DC Comics Presents. Uh, I didn't write that for Julie Schwartz, who was the editor of DC Comics Presents. D Julie was listed as the consulting editor of that issue, uh, and Dave Manick edited it. But I suppose uh, after I did that, Julie saw I didn't screw up Superman completely, so uh, he decided to give me a chance to um, uh, to, to do it. I've done some. I had done some other work for the Superman. Uh, family, you know, I'd written Jimmy Olsen and and uh, and uh, Supergirl and Superman family and things like that. So I wasn't a totally unknown quantity, but I had never really touched Superman before. That's awesome. And yeah, we should talk about some of those other Superman related stories that you did. I mean, like you said, Supergirl, Superboy as well, you know, so uh, Superman newspaper strip it's also so. And who was drawing that Superman newspaper strip? When you it was there? originally being drawn by uh, uh, George Tusca. Uh, and then it was taken over by Jose Delbo. That's amazing. Yeah. World's Greatest Heroes, I believe, was also the title of the It strip. was Originally, it was the World's Greatest Superhero starring Superman. Uh, but eventually, it just kind of dwindled down to Superman. Um, you know, they, we... That's great, man. Uh, Jerry Ordway, good to see you. Welcome again. And, Hi, uh, Jerry. Hey, absolutely. Hey, Jerry. So, you know, although I'm probably getting – all right, so who was, who was next in terms of – writing Superman or drawing Superman first? Because I'm really not sure. Around me. For 80s guys. I think me, right? Okay. So tell us your story about getting associated with the character, Jer. Um, I just really liked the movie, you know, the first movie a lot. I was a Marvel sure. guy, so it, I think uh, DC was publishing like some Jose Luis Garcia Lopez Superman drawn stories around that time of the movie, and it was uh, just really, to me, it captured the Christopher Reeve and, you know, Margot Kidder look. Uh, but I got asked to do it around the time of um, crisis and Dick Giordano was trying to do, figure out who was going to do relaunch stuff. And uh, he had asked me, he said, well, what do you want to do Batman or Superman? And I, I said, I don't know. And he said, well, I think you're more of a Superman guy. And that's basically how it happened. <laughs> so then I was on the, I was on the list for uh, doing Superman, you know, for a, it turned out more than a year, maybe close to two years until they could get, you know, the burn relaunch. And after that, restart the books and stuff. So um, as far as I worked with Marv Wolfman initially, then I wor worked with Byrne. And uh, then when Byrne left, I, Carlin said, asked me to submit or just give him ideas of writers that I would want to work with. And I gave him a couple of names and stuff. And he said, why don't you do it yourself? And I was like, really? You know, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't want to write. I just didn't think, you know, you're suddenly going to write Superman. Uh, so it was it was a, a really steep uh, educational kind of there was a learning curve. But the, the education was good. And Carlin was great. He uh, he basically tortured me for the first four months until I didn't quit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had good good things that nobody else told tells you. But he, his thing was. You know, when you're typing a script, not to have more than two lines of copy in the script, because that's what will fit in a balloon. And if there's more than two lines of typewritten script, break it into another balloon or eliminate, you know, try to. Uh, the other the other advice was I was too wordy. So he said, uh, what is it with you guys who, who draw and suddenly want to write? You're putting too many words in here. Let the art do more of it. So it was a it was a good education. I mean, he was the perfect guy to kind of, you know, haze me. <laughs> <laughs> Before uh, we get to Dan, I want to point out an observation from uh, Mark Harbinger, strange doctor, says uh, right now the panel looks like they all look like Clark Kent. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> So Dan, how did, how did the you first get... thing I think of is a bunch of Clark Kent's. I don't think so. <laughs> so how'd you stumble into the Daily Planet? 
Uh, I had been um, at DC for quite a while at that point, and uh, uh, right around that time, Marv and Jerry were doing their thing on the Superman books, and then that turned over. Uh, and Jerry, I think it was you and Roger kind of writing at yeah. that point. Yeah. And um, I drew an annual that Jim Starlin wrote. Uh, Mike had asked me to do that. And right after that, then George Perez became part of the group. And George was writing Adventures of Superman, which I started drawing. And after a couple of issues, George had to leave. Um, and Mike just asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, okay. And at that point, you know, I had been writing uh, quite a few different things at, at DC anyway. So uh, it just was natural to step right in. The funny thing is when when I was asked to draw Superman, I, I can't say that I was intimidated. Uh, and when they asked me to write it, I just said, sure, yeah, I'll do that. And I hung up the phone and kind of said, oh, my God, now what? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there is a little bit more of that mantle of responsibility because I've always found that as an artist, I know what I can do, right? I mean, it's just there on the page. I know what I can do, or theoretically what I can't do. But with a writer, it's a little bit different. You're working in a in, in much more of a dark room, I'd say. And and you just don't know if your instincts are necessarily right or not. And you trust your gut and hope for the best. Fair enough. Paul, um did you uh did you did you did you work under Julie Schwartz? Uh, oh yeah, for several years. It was yeah. uh, it was uh, it, it it was a little fanboy's uh, uh, culmination of a dream. Um, growing up, you know, I started reading comics around 1959, 1960, very young, um, and um, you know, eventually I kind of found my way to to the comics of Julie Schwartz because I was a DC fan because you know Marvel didn't exist when I started reading comics because yes. As I said before, we're old. Um, <laughs> but you're older. I'm oldest. Yeah. That's right. That's, we right. Stop. That's it. Hey, listen, <laughs> Medicare guys. Um, so, uh, uh, <laughs> so when I Superman, for various and sundry reasons, uh, was very important to me. He was kind of a, a lifeboat for me as a kid growing up because I had this very miserable childhood. And um, Superman was kind of the guy. I, you know, he and George Reeves and, the, you know, so, you know, I grew up in the Mort Weisinger era of Superman, but I was 15 when Julie took over with Kryptonite No More and, you know, the new stuff by, by uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, Swan, yeah, Swanderson and, yeah, Denny yeah. and all that. And so, you know, that was kind of this eye-opening thing. It's like I was just getting to be old enough to appreciate what Julie was trying to do. Um, and so it, it, so it just all stuck with me. Plus, Julie was the editor of The Flash, where the multiverse was invented on my birthday. Um, <laughs> if you look at the newspaper and the headline in Flash of Two Worlds, it's June 14th, 1961. And my birthday is June 14th. That's so fantastic. when I first saw that at 10, 9, 10 years old, it was just like, done, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is my world. Um, and, um, you know, so in my in the back of my head, no matter what I was doing, there was always that, like, you're not really writing comic books until you've written Superman for Julie Schwartz. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I get you it. You know, it was just growing up as a fan of the 60s, Julie, I know Stan gets his credit for being a great editor. But Stan wasn't really an editor. Stan was more of a writer who kind of, you know, mar you know, who, who, you know, he didn't, he didn't work on other people to edit them. You know, he worked on himself for the most part. Uh, Julie was was a true old school editor. He didn't, he couldn't do the job himself, although he could, but he didn't. Um, but he knew exactly what he was looking for and how to get it out of his uh, out of his his writers and his artists. Um, and there was just something about his 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 old school methods. It's you know 1940s fedora on the back of the head kind of kind of uh, lifestyle that just his voice evoked. That you know, um, it, it was just it. It was just you know that was the big moment for me when I got to write were, Superman for Julie. Were you scared of him? Oh yeah, at first, yeah, <laughs> the crap out of me. First time I ever spoke Everybody to Julie was. Schwartz was in the men's room at 75 Rockefeller Center. <laughs> I was standing there at the urinal, and he comes in and goes his next urinal, and I'm standing there, and I can't pee because Julie Schwartz is standing there. <laughs> and he looks over at me, and he goes, how you doing? 
You know, and I want to say, I can't pee. Get out of here. But, <laughs> and he yeah. said, I can't pee either. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the funny thing is? I think when I first met him, he was probably younger or about the same age I am now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perspective. That, that I know. To think about. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I get it, man. But I, um, uh, yeah, he was he was something. He was an impressive figure. In fact, I uh, uh, I found this videotape, uh, which I, I'm sure John was going to ask me about. Absolutely, um, was. it was a, pre a slide presentation Julie gave at a uh, convention in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in 1988. It's called "50 Years of Superman," and it's this whole slideshow with Julie narrating it, um, and somebody videotaped it and edited it together so you got a good look at all the slides and the whole thing um and julie was throwing it out when he was retiring i pulled so much gold out of julie's garbage can when he was when he was uh, you know uh, closing up his office at dc most of it i gave to the library at dc because that's where it belonged but this i kept uh because it was his own personal tape and um i finally uncovered it a few months ago and sent it to someone who digitally transferred it and just watched it the other night and it's like just sitting there listening to that guy, you know, and talking in his <laughs> gruff Julie voice. Yeah, that was, you know, that was a pleasure. But it's still this this wonderful little artifact. I don't know if if it if he ever did the presentation at any other comic convention. This hmm. may have been the only time he gave it. So um, anyway, I've would... had it digitally transferred, and as soon as we can work out the details, uh, there's going to be a a, a world premiere watch party at. Uh, uh, back issue magazine's Facebook page. Oh, fantastic. And then it'll go and then it'll go up on YouTube so that uh, future historians can have access. I've been, I look forward to watching it, man, ever since you I saw the picture <laughs> yeah. of the videotape. There's like, nothing right, revel right. there's nothing revelatory in it. There's no new news. It's just kind of the guy who was there talking about it, you know, telling the stories. It, it, it's cool. Well, you know, honestly, I mean, because literally every moment now is videotaped yeah. for posterity. And and it's times that's annoying, but also it's a good thing. And truly, I do believe Tell that, that to my parole officer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in that pre 90s, uh, before really yeah. digital really took off, there are so many gaps in the 20th century history. And truly, it's been a pleasure talking to not only yourselves, but the older creators as well that go back to the silver age when I, when they I got get to talk older? to people yeah. well, well, and some of us <laughs> sometimes <some> of them <laughs> are, are no longer with us. People like Gene Colan, but I've had a chance to talk to Gene and Neil Adams and sure. Storenko and, and guys like that, because I want, I mean, it's important to get the record straight. And I do think that a lot of us comic fans sometimes look at that period with rose colored glasses and, or don't get the, the right story. Yeah. So I, I mean, thank God there were things like comics journal and amazing heroes and, mm -hmm. You know, things like that. David Anthony Kraft's great comics interview yeah. that, that did have the opportunity to speak to these people. And I love what uh, the people at Back Issue do, but also Two Morrows in general. John Morrow, yeah. a great right. company that, uh, yeah, just make sure that, again, that the record is set straight. And people like, you know, Roy Thomas with uh, Alter Ego and, and other creators use Back Issue and Alter Ego to, to talk to these guys and, and get the story straight. So that's important, you know. Well, in, in 1988, there was a lot of DC um, Superman events. So I think they did the same thing for Batman during the Batman year. There were a lot. I mean, they did they had Jerry Robinson traveling, you know, a bunch of shows to do panels and things like that. But uh, but the Superman one was fun because we got to do the Smithsonian had their Superman exhibit. We got to attend that. Um, Kurt Swan was there. Julie. I mean, most of the old time Superman guys, they sent there too. Um, but then we also had that, there was that party at the Puck building, I think in um, like maybe October up towards, it was like the last event, I think of the celebration and uh, Mayor Koch showed up for, you know, like three seconds just for the TV cameras to get a little sound bite. It was, it was really hilarious to watch that, but um, there was, there was a lot. DC hired a agency, uh, uh, pub, you know, public relations type agency to, to promote it. So it, I don't think that's been done since, you know, I think they spent like a million bucks on, uh, on promoting Superman's 50th, uh, that type of thing. Doesn't, I don't think it happens anymore. I think, you know, it would happen within Warner now or, you know, that type of thing, but it's not the same outreach. Oh, Elliot is watching. And yes, Elliot, uh, if you can hear us, I will uh, say that uh, maybe I screwed up and sent you the wrong time. So uh, please, please, Follow that link that I sent you in your email and uh, join the party because uh, I, I, I apologize that I uh, might have said it wrong. 
man, I'll tell you, I'm doing everything wrong today. Butterfingers. They're never going to let me moderate another mainframe Comic Con panel again. I understand. <laughs> um, Booster G wanted uh, Jerry to uh, tell the Bron the Boombox Superman story. Oh well, and it's it's not even my story to tell necessarily. But Andy Helfer's not here, I guess. But Helfer had before the Superman relaunch happened. Helfer had given some kind of interview, or maybe it was right after. There was some some question about what the new Superman would look like, and one of his ideas, he he had thrown it out in in an interview somewhere, was that you know like maybe Howard Chaykin would do the relaunch of Superman, and Superman would be flying with a boombox on his, you know, on his shoulder, listening to tunes while he's flying around Metropolis, and I just remember thinking like, oh my God, are we? like really glad as comic fans that that didn't happen. I, just, I would, uh, frankly, I would pay today to see Howard's, uh, oh, it could let, let Howard be job. Howard and do Superman. <laughs> yeah. I pay for that. Yeah. I don't know that even Howard would have done a boom box thing, but it was just no. a funny image and, and, and how, how tied to that very specific time it was. The only thing more crazy would have been Superman break dancing or something. You know what I mean? To, <laughs> To kind of tie it to whatever was was trending at the time. Well, as as uh, Jerry and Dan know, uh, certainly they had to deal with a, a little bit of a cosmetic change to Superman, and that was the infamous mullet uh, post uh, death. It was Superman never a mullet. Tell me, right, Dan, correct me. Never a mullet. God, by all means, correct me, Dan. Talk to <laughs> Thank <me>. you. <laughs> a mullet is me. like neat on the sides, long in the back. This was just long hair. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. Plus, Everybody, the part of it is the, the other artists would draw uh, both John Bogdanov and Tom Grummet had ponytails at that time, and they'd draw Clark Kent with this long ponytail. I never did. I never had it that long, and I swore. I said, you know, you can't have Superman and Clark Kent walking around in a ponytail, for God's sake. So I never well, you, Some you long hair Carlin, itself should have been. Yeah. Carlin even had a ponytail for a very short time. Yeah. Let me, let yeah. me introduce uh, Elliot Magan, who never put uh, Superman in a leisure suit, thankfully, in the 19th <laughs> or Clark Kent, for that matter. But Elliot, it's it's great to see you. Apologies for uh, screwing up and probably giving you the wrong time, but it's great to see you. Hey, Elliot. How you doing? Hey, Elliot. How you doing? Hey, Elliot. I'll live. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Elliot. In this pandemic, it's good to hear that you live. Don't kid yeah. yourself, man. Um, Elliot, what was when you first got the gig? I asked the guys earlier, so we'll get you up to speed and ask you uh, uh, how did how did it happen when you when you first got the opportunity to write Superman? Well, it was the maybe the third story I wrote um, for Julie. Wow. I had uh, well, I mean, what happened was Denny hated the series. Denny hated writing it, and uh, <laughs> Julie wanted uh, Julie wanted. Uh, to put somebody on it, and I was sitting there. So he said, can you handle a Superman story? And I said, sure. Um, he said, you know, it's the hardest character to write. And I said, okay. And I believed it for years until I realized it wasn't. Um, it was just a matter of how to approach it. That's it. You know, Jerry mentioned that obviously just making that uh, leap from pure artist to writer artist, um, there was that thing. But yeah, guys, uh, Dan, Dan and Paul, any, any initial fear? Or difficulty in terms of well, when the opportunity came. Who me? Well, I was going to ask Paul. You just you you you, oh, you know me? yeah you know. Uh, I was um, I, I I I was fortunate enough to be too young and too stupid to be uh, intimidated. Um, you know, it was kind of like you you get a gig uh, so in comic books. Your job is to you know walk into a character and write a story. Uh, you may never have you know done more than read. Two, two other stories about that character, uh, but you should be able to walk in and write anybody and anything. I mean, that's, you know, in retail writing, that's the job. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, looking back, I wish I had been a little bit more intimidated. I think I would have done, you know, less stories like, you know, the, the great Toy Man trivia contest and things like that. But, um, you know, but it was the era and those were the stories that were being done. Fair enough. Dan, any, any apprehension? I I don't know about apprehension, but I do know that I was a bit intimidated by the notion because I think uh, everybody who's writing in comics, they sort of say they have their two great Batman stories, they have they they have their two great Superman stories, Flash, whatever. But what then? And, and I think that's always the part of it that when you accept uh, the idea of writing a series, 
it isn't just getting those great stories out of your system. It is, well, after issue 542, eventually you're getting to 548, and then what do you have? And it is, (laughs) that I think is when you really start to examine what is it that you are trying to say about the character. Fair enough, L. Um, and we're getting great questions, and I'll get to them in a second because some of these are really interesting, and I'll definitely go around the horn. But as someone, uh, L, that you you know you wrote you wrote the character for like over a decade. How many yeah. years did you write it? About fifteen, 15 years. years. Yeah. yeah. So, so did you just like Jan, Dan just said in terms of you know near the end were you was the well empty was there, I mean was it easy for you to keep going you know as far as Superman goes you know what I mean Oh, I I'd write it now if I could. That's why I was writing comics. I wanted to do Superman. Still do. I, well, I understand, man. And I'll tell you, as I'm sure it might come up with uh, various people, uh, we were last night, literally, L, just talking about uh, both Last Son of Krypton and Miracle Monday, those incredible Superman novels that you great wrote. Great books. Yeah. We, we discussed them in a great Word Balloon uh, talk recently. And also, I want to let people know that you've got your podcast feed where if you, want, if you enjoy books on tape, Check out Elliot Magan reading Miracle Monday and Last Son of Krypton. What's what's that uh, feed? Where's that at, man? It's called Elliot Makes Stuff Up. It's everywhere. It's on <laughs> Spotify and TuneIn and whatever else. Amazon Podcasts. I can't get it up on, on Alexa for some reason. I don't know how to do that. But Have think- you asked her? <laughs> yeah, she, keeps, she keeps feeding. I, I say, um, play Elliot Makes Stuff Up, and she plays some porn thing. So... <laughs> Here are the Hollies with Elliot makes stuff up. <laughs> Fronty and Taisha. <laughs> All right, around the horn, I, I like this. Uh, Bradley Tan, who do you think is Superman's toughest, most meaningful adversary? That's a that because and and really the Superman um, Rose Gallery isn't like the Flash, mm-hmm. isn't like Batman. So, Paul, we'll start with you. I guess it would have to be Luther. I mean, I don't think there's anybody else who, you know, has that quite that personal connection. You know, they're, they're uh, yin and yang characters. It's uh, although, you know, I grew up with a Lex Luthor who was pissed at Superboy because he made him lose his hair. Um, you know, it, it was thin motivation in those days, but you know, it's still, he is, he's the opposite of Superman, you know, Superman, uh, uh, is is good and Luther is evil. It's not like you know. It's like you know, in the real world, I don't think people consider themselves evil. You know, even the guy who's doing the worst thing can justify himself. Sure. But Luther was just like, no, man, I'm an evil scientist. You know, that was his job. Um. So yeah, <laughs> I think that does it. I think he had motivation. Oh, he did later on. But I think he was the hero of his own story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and really, oh, again, in Last Son of Krypton, that dynamic between Superman and Luther, especially the Silver Age interpretation where these guys knew each other when they were kids. Superboy and Lex Luthor were good friends. Uh, they helped each other. And uh, I unfortunately, you know, I think Lex knows how to push Clark's buttons uh, still, even though he doesn't know that it's the same guy necessarily. Or does he? Is that there's an interesting subtext. I don't know if. You know, again, as we, we talk to all of you, do you think Lex knew all along? No, I'll ask you specifically. I don't see how we could not know. But then again, <laughs> do glasses make a mask? I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, guys, are there, are there any other opinions of who Superman's greatest enemy is? Dan? Uh, I would not say enemy, but... Or adversary? I would say obstacle in many ways is himself. And, and it's because I think that as, as we look at the world around us, I think we all constantly say, we see a problem somewhere, and you'd say, well, if I had superpowers, I'd go fix that, right? And I think um, with Superman, one of the interesting things to always play with is he imposed this, this limit, this wall, this fence that he won't cross. He, he himself drew the line in the sand. And I think it's always fun to play with that notion of temptation of when would Superman cross that would he cross it? What would it mean if he did? And I find it, that to me is what I find fascinating about the character is that in uh, in a previous time, they said, you know, he has a code against killing, but he, he had a code, if you will, against a whole lot more things than that. And he basically was someone who said, I'm going to allow mankind to make their own mistakes. But to me, that's the part it is. So I look at it more as an obstacle or a barrier than I do enemy. 
I so, totally agree. That was exactly what I was going to say. I think he he feels like a character in the way we did it. You know, we're trying to do the '80s '90s thing. Was that he was always in control because he's a character who could very easily be perceived as a bad guy if he went off. And that when we when we were doing the books, we were trying to, you know, we always tried to keep from doing stories. And if a story was suggested or some other um, outside creator was going to do a, a standalone or something, I think we tried to fight against the idea that Superman would be the villain because it seems like that's you know hard to put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, his if someone was that powerful in real life, you would fear him because he could do anything, you know. And I think his job as Superman or his whole persona was to be comforting and not threatening. And I think that's a lot harder than people think it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that you, you, you would have to keep in mind, like uh, just every action that he did. That's, I mean, that was the, the, the thing about being Clark Kent. He could kind of let loose and do stuff like that with, uh, you know, just be himself a little bit. But yeah, I think, I think his, his, that one force that he was working against was keeping himself in control. Not that he would want to kill somebody or that he would, I mean, but the potential is there and the potential to, to look bad and maybe ruin his reputation or what have you. Well, that dovetails into, uh, and forgive me, was someone going to speak? I don't want to, I don't want to step on anybody because I'm the least important person here other than guiding some of the questions along mentioning that Jerry, in terms of how powerful he is day spring asks, uh, under what circumstances, and again, I'm going to go around the hall on a horn, and I'll start with Paul. Under what circumstances, if any, do you think that Superman should kill someone, Paul? I don't know. I mean, it, it, it I don't think he should. I think there, there's, um, you know, it, it, it's my morale, you know, uh, that's my moral stance is I should never kill somebody. Why is Superman any different? Whether he should or shouldn't, I mean, uh, you know, it, that genie was out of the bottle in, in you know, Superman 2 when he, when he killed the, uh, or did he kill the, the, the Kryptonian villains, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I think he's Superman. There should be other ways out, you know. I think any one of us could have, could have written around, the, you know, him killing uh, Zod, uh, you know, cover his freaking eyes. Yeah, you really? know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, so that wasn't a necessary killing. That was just a badly written part of a story. Um, well, it happened. It happened in the comics too when John Byrne was writing. I, and, and forgive me, Paul. I didn't. If if you no, no, no. Go ahead. Well, and I would, and and I will get to Jer uh, Jerry and Dan about that because it was around the time that you guys were associated with the character when uh, he made that decision about uh, again the three the same uh, characters mm -hmm. from uh, yeah. from the Superman two. Wait. When when he when John uh, sent that story in, um, basically I felt like Mike Carlin and Roger Stern and I used it as a an opportunity to, you know, have him question himself and que that's that led to the exile in you know exile in space storyline. Yes, I mean, we used it. I do think I mean, and in defense of, um, maybe I'm the only guy here, but I like Man of Steel. I like Batman versus Superman. You know, it's just, I don't see, um, like in a comic when you're doing multiple, you know, it's a monthly book or whatever, I see it differently than a movie. Sure. In the movie, it's like looking at a, you're looking at just that two hours, really, to me, or maybe three movies max as the, the way it goes with the, but comics are forever. Like when Byrne had the his Kryptonian uh, characters killed, he was the only witness to that on that world. So it was totally internalized. I mean, the only other character that survived that storyline in that pocket universe was the Supergirl that we call the Matrix because she was basically reverted back to protoplasm. And um, so, again, being internalized, that was, to me, felt like something where, you know, in the 60s, Spider-Man goes on the couch and talks to a psychiatrist. Well, you can't really do that. So instead, Superman internalizes it, kind of tries to clamp it down, and he winds up having problems with it. Um, but right. I think here, in a, this is one thing you're mentioning about covering Zod's eyes, and it made me think of, and I'm trying to remember, I can't now, I can't think of what movie it was. I was watching a movie, and oh no, it was uh, it was the Justice League, one of the cartoons, and it was based on it was the Dark Side War, and I was kind of aghast watching it that like they're the Justice League basically just rips. 
dark side's eyes out or whatever. That was the, the solution to it is Omega beams. It was just like, wow, that's gross. So oh. yeah, they could have done that in uh, Man of Steel, but about you know, ten years I, ago, I'd about ten years ago, there was this whole raft of <laughs> of arms being ripped off in comics. <laughs> right. I mean, yes. all of a sudden, it's like dismemberment seemed to be the way to go. <laughs> That's I, funny, Gary, yeah. because I remember the Superman episode, the animated series, where uh, Superman is brainwashed into believing he's Dark Side's uh, son, and he grabs uh, Dark Side's head. And the force beams explode, and it, his head doesn't blow off. But there are more <laughs> cracks on his face and his helmet, and he's totally weakened. And there's this amazing scene where the people of Apocalypse rush to the aid of Darkseid and pick him up. And then in a great – I mean, truly, there have been so many great moments in the comics and in the animated things. And here was a moment where uh, Darkseid turned to Superman and said, you don't understand. On this world, I'm God. And and they carry him away, and it just I thought it was an incredibly <laughs> great uh, dark side and Superman exchange and everything. But Al, what do you think of the 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 killing thing? No, under any circumstances, not at all. It's a failure of storytelling. Fair enough, I understand. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, you know. No, Snyder wanted to be the kid who kicked over the paint can in the garage. He doesn't know anything. <laughs> For heaven's sakes, you don't put an objectivist in charge of Superman. But in, in, in also what's funny is, in fairness, and I, I, think I, I think I could speak for Carlin as well, if Byrne didn't do it, I mean, we did, neither of us were on board with it necessarily, but it was John, I mean, John was convinced of it, and then he wound up leaving after that. I don't think it would have happened if, you know, he hadn't done it. You know what I'm saying? I think, you know, the, the, our, our, even our storyline with having Superman die required a sign off from Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz and Dick Giordano in a way. So, well, I mean, I, I think John was in a different stratosphere as far as, uh, you know, his, his powers or his influence or whatever. So um, I, I still think, I mean, I think we made good stories out of it and I don't think it, I don't think it ruined the character. I do think that the potential is always there with a character that powerful that he could have done it accidentally too. And, and then, you know, we weren't in, in the sixties, well, comics code. And I think the, the norm was different back then too, in a way. To, to jump in for a second. I mean, the, what happened in the comic and what happened in the movie were entirely different when in the movie, when Superman killed Zod, at least it was a situation where, you know, Zod was trying to kill the innocent civilians and Superman saw it as, well, I have to do this or else kind of thing. Uh, in the comic, it was a cold, stone cold execution. Yeah. I mean, he basically put him in the electric chair and was judge, jury and executioner at that point. So those are even in and of themselves, massively different concepts. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Now, Jacob, Jake, oh, excuse me. Another thought on this before I move to another question. It's kind of tied. Um, all right. Jacob Westfall says, and this is a great question. Uh, for and especially Jerry and Dan, who actually certainly Dan, who created Doomsday, Jerry working during this status quo. What effect do you think the death of Superman has had on comics and the general public's consciousness of Superman? And I love that idea because he is such an important pop culture character that literally we get documentaries like Waiting for Superman that have nothing to do with the with the cape per se, but just the ideal. And I mean, that's the thing. So yeah, talk talk about that period. And I mean, you know, again, I've I've talked to you both, Jerry and Dan, before about it, but yeah, for the purposes of today, any, any thoughts on, on how that story happened and what you guys wrestled with and also how the observation of how it affected the public. I, I felt like the, the main takeaway from it was personal because we were really, I mean, it's hard to, we were, we were dealing with the comic stores, not wanting to buy, you know, Superman. So we still sold on a newsstand. I mean, this just from a, different point of view, not just the story aspect of, oh, killing him off, but there was definitely a subtext of Superman's not getting the attention it deserves. We were all getting good reviews from people who read the books. They liked them, but they weren't buying them in big numbers. That aside, that all fit into World Without Superman. That was that was the appeal, at least to me. And I think, you know, in the room, the feeling was we do this, we're basically showing how much you will miss Superman when he's gone, even if he's not gone permanently, because people kind of took him for granted. And that, you know, in that way, it succeeded. Whether there's a, the you know, Dan can speak to the long, the people still like the storyline. 
So regardless of the comic boom that went with it, the storyline's still popular among fans who read it when they were kids or it was an entry point for them to read comics for years after that. So it was successful in many ways. Um, and uh, I still think it was, you know, the stuff that happened afterwards was great. I thought when I left the book, Dan and the, the other guys and lady did a great job with the return of Superman. It was a story that I enjoyed reading as a fan, you know. Um, but yeah, so I think I think it has long long term effect in the way that any kind of milestone, you know, comic story would have. Uh, except that there were probably you know a couple, maybe a couple, a million people who read it. Uh, as opposed to a smaller number, but you know, like me as a kid reading Spider Man walking away from his costume in the trash can was a major moment for me as a 10 year old because I thought, wow, superheroes quit, and I can't believe this, you know. So it's a cultural thing for anybody, probably 20 years later or something, 30 years. If uh, if you write, if you're writing stories. If you if you're writing stories about Superman's importance to the world and you want to uh, hit on that by taking Superman away the same way as you examine someone's importance to you personally at a memorial service or something like that and get so lucky is to have columnists across the country writing columns like that as your stories are being published and create that sort of uh, synergy between reality and fiction. Um, we were lucky enough to actually have that happen. Uh, and it's probably something that will never happen in comics again. Um, but I think that is what ended up really sort of proving the, what Superman's importance is to us as a society, because that's exactly what happened. If you, if you have newspapers running polls as to whether or not Superman should come back from the dead and stuff like that, which we did at that time, I mean, that's a total and complete win. And it was all about Superman's character in the long run. So I think it's a total and complete win. Yeah, I mean, I found uh, years later in, in, when I did the Death of Archie story, um, you know, certainly didn't have the same impact as uh, or, or sales as uh, Death of Superman. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it still, it brought people out to go, you know, who hadn't thought about Archie for forever. Uh, suddenly they remember Archie and they were outraged that we were killing him. You know, it didn't matter that it was a, an alternate universe, you know, what if Archie <laughs> that was dying? It was still, we were killing the beloved Archie. And, you know, the Superman, I mean, I was on staff at the time uh, that was going on. And I remember the day the news broke. And I don't think anybody expected the reaction. I know nobody expected the reaction that, 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 that they got. The, the, it blew up. It became the major, new. you know, it was... Uh, 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 a day where nothing, you know, nobody blew up and, and nobody did anything particularly evil. So Superman dying made the, made the front page. And, um, you know, it, it really did spark that character again. Uh, you know, Paul, I'm glad you mentioned death of Archie because uh, really life with Archie, that whole run was so terrific Thank you. and uh, absolutely, man. And it really, it added a, a real depth to the characters to see them age and how they interacted with each other. Yeah, you know, as as older characters, Ella as, as someone that you know again observed the writing of of the death of Superman and stuff. Any any uh, what did what did you you know what was your reaction when you, when you heard what they were doing? Um, I thought it worked as a stunt. They got real lucky um, with the timing of it, but uh, yeah, increase the sales. That's that's the name of the game. Uh, you know, and and it's true. And as Jerry and and, and Dan pointed out too. It was this weird, like, kind of sn slow news day, and it really was this incredible international story. And I remember the day that seventy five came out. It is the first and only time that there was a line to get into the comic shop, let alone buy the thing. Well, yeah. What did that and move it, like seven and a half million copies or something? It was a healthy amount. Yeah. Ah, 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 <laughs> we haven't we haven't put our auditors to work yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I. The day Brinkley used to do the, the Sunday morning show on ABC. And he said in an interview at some point, you know, I'd like I'd like there to be no news one day. <laughs> a few weeks later, he always started the show with, here's the news from the last 12 hours. And at some point he said, there wasn't any. He really thought. 
I loved how cynical he got at the end and literally had to apologize to President Clinton because he had said about just being on the campaign trail and I tired right. of chicken dinners and all that stuff. I love David Brinkley. He was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And only he could get away with stuff like that. Day Spring, great question. And let's go around the horn. You know, again, uh, L, uh, cause they moved, they moved the setting from the planet to WGBS and Paul, you were, you were in that time as well. Right. How is it, how hard was it to write Superman's supporting cast? And I mean, not, let's, let's include the WGBS people like Morgan edge and Steve, Steve Lombard, Lombard, the great Steve. Lombard, Lombard. Absolutely. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I kind of like that. You know, I always had more fun writing Clark than I did writing Superman. Um, Clark was the real guy. Clark was the guy who had friends. And, uh, you know, when I was doing Superboy, we lived in this ridiculous bubble where if he did anything that any other normal kid could do, he was worried people would suspect he's Superboy. You know, I can't get a straight A's because they might think I'm Superboy. <laughs> I can't hit this baseball or they might think I'm Superboy. <laughs> And finally, I just, I couldn't stand it any longer. So I, I actually had him, you know, get into a pickup uh, uh, a softball game and hit the ball and nothing disastrous happened and nobody, you know, and then he gets a girlfriend and is like, that's interesting. You know, this one dimensional cutout where, you know, where he just had to be this, this scarecrow to, to for Superman to kind of hide behind uh, was ridiculous. Um, so, you know, you, you needed to bring the humanity to the character. I, I don't. I think for the for the first, you know, thirty five years or so, thirty years, he was pretty much, you know, just a Superman and Clark were just cardboard cutouts. You know, truth, justice, the American way, and you know, mild mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. Period. Well, um, a lot of that, a lot of that added characterization came during Elliot and Kurt and sure. Uh, and Carrie yeah. Bates' time. It was time. Elliot and Carrie and Marty Pasco and, and, Marty and Pasco you know, yeah. Marty, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'll talk about that. Talk about because I always give it up to you for uh Clark Kent Forever, Superman Never, one of uh yeah. my favorite stories of your era. I, I just like the idea of letting Clark do stuff Superman could. So every story I would have him goof on Steve Lombard. Yeah. Something, you know, make his pants fall down with his superpower. <laughs> um Superman can't do that. Superman can't call somebody an idiot because he's Superman. But Clark can call anybody anything he wants. Right. And I, I always had uh, uh, Lombard stuff backfire on him because yeah. of something Clark did. Just I stole that from you. <laughs> so you. Awesome. I'm yeah. sorry. I brought it. I brought it forward from your time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I. You know, and again during that Clark Kent Forever story, where he finally can really just like match. Steve Lombard for being a bully and be like, no, fuck you. Wait a minute. <laughs> really like getting in his face. Language. And, and, language. No, sorry. <laughs> I know. I I see, I'm used to word balloon where I'm able to drop <laughs> F-bomb. So you'll forgive me, everybody. But, uh, but I, yeah, I, I no, I did. I, I just, it was really a great chance to see Clark cut loose to the point, L, as you know, um, where he and Lois went uh, into Clark's apartment and we don't know what happened. And they put it, <laughs> you know, the news make the newsmaker section of Newsweek and the people section of Time, they had these little paragraphs and they'd, they'd put in, 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 in boldface uh, the names of the people that they were talking about. And the names of the people they were talking about were Clark Lois and Superman. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Carrie. It wasn't Kurt. It was <laughs> we didn't get coverage, but, but they did. That's Our outstanding. Um, during the making of uh, the first movie, the Richard Donner movie, uh, you know, Mark Mark Harbinger says, has anyone seen the Christopher Reeves interviews where he so eloquently said what Superman means culturally? How lucky we all were that he took that role. Yeah, do you guys, uh, especially Paul and, and all, do you guys have any stories? And uh, Dan and Jerry as well. Any Christopher Reeve encounters, um, you know, that either prior to the movie or after the movie? He was at the Smithsonian. He and uh, Margot Kidder were at the Smithsonian and uh, I, didn't, I didn't bother him. I, it was like you could tell when they walked in the room that all the lights went over to them and and uh i remember burn saying i'm gonna go over and meet them <laughs> and i just i was never that forward so we watched him walk over worm his way through the reporters and you know shake uh, christopher reeve's hand and say hi to margo kidder and i thought yeah see that i'm like clark kent i'm not gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> i i met uh, uh reeve when he first came up to dc uh, this string bean with brown hair came into the office uh, wearing a corduroy jacket, I remember. Very hip. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I looked at him and I went, oh, my God, we're in trouble. 
<laughs> but then I was I was on staff at the time. I was assistant to the public relations guy. So I was seeing all the photos coming in of the uh, from location, and suddenly that you know that skinny little twig turned into Superman. And um, you know, for me, for that movie, I, I still remember. Uh, I saw it at the uh, at, at the uh, uh, Esquire Theater in Chicago on the on first showing. Uh, you know, man, just goosebumps. When you know, the credits was, rolled, huh? As soon as the credits came on, you knew it was yep. a special ride. Well, yeah, and those were the days too when you had an overture before yeah. the film started, yeah. and it really was such an event. And they had that great uh, William score playing yeah. before before the movie even started and stuff. L, did you didn't weren't because I know Marty used to tell me that he got to really sit down with Chris yeah. Reeves and, and go over I, things. Did you as well? Me when he was coming in, Saul was worried I'd say something. But <laughs> Saul was always worried about me. I don't know why. But I have was, no idea. He was <laughs> but he was in some play or something um, after Superman 2. And I had this Hardcover copy of Last on a Krypton. I, I I wormed my way backstage and convinced him to sign it. He thought I'd come to the play, I guess, but uh, I just kind of sneaked in. So I got to meet him once. He was very nice, gracious, tall. <laughs> Other than that, no. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the book again, El, because um, the rights have reverted back to you, and you have re you've put those books but both miracle monday at a boy but means drew a single yeah single out uh elliot for a second so he can show those uh, great books i'll i'll make you hold them up again l no where the other one is so but yeah last son of krypton boom beautiful soft cover i still have my original uh, printings as do i so do i, I. You know, yeah, man. No, I, I, and then sadly, if I knew you were republishing them, L, I, I would have bought the new copies, but no. I immediately went to Amazon and found the used book and I had to buy it because it's truly one of the best. As Brian yeah. Bennett and I were talking about it last night, how much we I had books. 20 of them, and I, I figured I'd put it in the attic and never, never touch it. I don't know where they are, but my parents sold that house. Ah. <laughs> Son of a gun. Well, that was, you know, I, I'm, I was a big fan of, of novelizations since I'm a kid. You know, I remember Captain America and the Great Gold Steel and, and uh, the Avengers versus the Earth Wreckers in the 60s. And, uh, you know, there was some there was some of that being done. But Elliot's was the first one that just like, you know, didn't treat it like a comic book in prose. Elliot wrote it like a like a novel. Yeah, you know, he good. wrote it like a story. And, and uh, you know, it, <laughs> Bendis and I were kids. Yeah. yeah, man. I mean, honestly, no, we said the same thing as 13-year-olds when we read the book. And it's like, this is amazing. By and the way, read his incredible. Kingdom Come adaptation. And uh, abs and L, absolutely too. a great, a great adaptation. And a, and beyond a novelization, you yeah. put a lot more of, of the story in there, L. And in fact, Mark Wade and I talked about that as well recently. So it was so great, man. I, I was telling Wade that I, I was going to talk to all four of you. And immediately, and, and again, man, like these guys like Brian Bendis and Mark and I, we're all around the same age. And really, man, you guys, you guys were our heroes. I'm not, I'm not, that's not hyperbole. And truly your, your writings uh, of everything you did, but really, especially Superman as well, meant so much to us. So, uh, you know, in fact, somebody on the chat earlier had asked Dan what, what, uh, how, how, uh, how you felt about handing things off to, uh, to Bendis as you did just a couple of years ago. Well, it, it was fine. I mean, I got to um, build to the end of the story. And I think as Brian and I have both told you, you know, DC was really good about bringing us together so we could sit down and really work through everything that had to happen so that we could make it work and make it work well. Um, so they did a good job with it. And I think the opportunity to make for that kind of a seamless transition is always a, a positive. It, the readers win when that happens. Agreed. And, and you know, uh, next week on DC Fandom, uh, Dan is going to be talking to Brian Bendis and Gene Lewin Yang, and they have an opportunity to interview Dan. And I, I look forward to that conversation. Brian has told me a bit about that. Paul and Elliot and Jerry, was there ever that kind of like at least, you know, as you hand it off, was there any sort of meeting of minds with the next creative teams? Well, I, when I did, when I left Superman, I was, I handed it off to Carl Kiesel and Carl and I did, I mean, I knew Carl for years before that. So I knew it was in good hands. Um, and then when Carl was 
backing off. I guess he had like another commitment. He uh, had me come back on in like 97 to do some dialogue on his plots. So I worked for about a year on that. Um, and then there was not a good handoff from the Eddie Braganza takeover. So uh, it was, you know, I don't, I don't know what's story wise, whether they followed anything or not. I know Dan stayed on, but uh you know, it's it's always better, I think, for the reader to have a handoff that's good, you know, and, and smooth. Um, we tried to do that when Marv left the uh, Adventures of Superman. Um, that uh, you know, it wasn't like suddenly, oh, we're reinventing everything or or, or whatever, because you know, the continuity part of it is it was always important to me as a reader. So um, I always think of that in terms of what's somebody going to read? Are they going to be confused? Are they going to be mad? You know. Understood. Um, yeah, Elliot, w did you guys hand off to Burn? Was was yours like kind of that pre-crisis or during? No, crisis? Go ahead. It, and that, oh, I want to hear your thoughts too. Yeah, Jeanette. Jeanette had a dinner at some Japanese restaurant where everybody sat on the floor. <laughs> Did you have to wear kimonos? I don't know. We had to take off our shoes though, and um, <laughs> we called it the "I Love Superman" dinner, and all the guys were there. Except Paul. And Paul was the only exec type who actually liked Superman. Jeanette never liked him as a character. And I, I wrote a memo after that saying, let's start from zero. Let's do this. Let's do that. And wrote a business plan, basically, instead of a, uh, a rehash of the character's origins. Um, but we're leaving. I was, I was with Carrie we're walking down the street. I said, you know, we're losing our jobs. <laughs> and he said, oh, where'd you hear that? I said, I'm a politician. I know these things. <laughs> We're losing our jobs. So we did. About a year later, less than a year later. Wow. That's amazing. Paul, And you know any handoff? Or? It wasn't exactly a handoff. I mean, back then it was kind of, um, you know, I started writing for Julian the last four years or so of his editorial ship. And he was now not exactly at the top of his game. I mean, you know, there had been better stuff done earlier. Um, uh, and um, it was really, you know, uh, a handful of us who were writing the Superman stuff. You know, there was, uh, you know, a few of us who, who did, I did about a third of the of the Superman stuff or, or action and DC Comics Presents for a few years, you know, and other people were doing, were doing the rest of it. And there wasn't, continuity per se. I mean, I, I was doing continuity in Supergirl and Superboy, but that wasn't, um, you know, that, that they both got, you know, obliterated by the crisis. So there was no handoff. Um, okay. But yeah, there was no, you know, it was just like, you're no longer writing Superman stories because John Byrne is taking over. You you did a good job with Julie, Paul. Thank you. you. You were Not only that, but you were following. He was going through a bad time. He, he, lost he was. Life. He was acting out. He was being weird, and uh, and Paul uh, pretty much followed him around and kept him out of trouble. That was, that was I I, uh, I I loved the man. He was very special to me. Um, you know, he meant a lot to me growing up. Um, he's uh, he's the he's the only guy I know from comics who I cried when he died. No, that's not true. Uh, Marty Marty was the second guy I cried when he died. Yeah, I understand, buddy. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, you know, Julie was special. He meant a lot to me, and and uh, it was my privilege to to get to work with him. That's awesome. We're we're closing up, guys, and uh, in these final minutes, um, first of all, thank you to all of you for coming on Word Balloon as much as you have, and certainly coming here for Mainframe Comic Con. We remind everyone uh, promote, uh, promoting the Hero Initiative. Listen, uh, a lot of freelancers don't have an exit plan, and a lot of terrible financial hardship could happen early in their career or late in the career. And the Hero Initiative takes care of that. Heroinitiative.org. If you're watching on Mainframe Comic Con's main page, make sure you click the donate button uh, and uh, and support these things because really uh, these these guys can attest to the freelancer life and how tough it can be. Uh, so so anything you can do in these weird times to support the Hero Initiative with uh, a donation would greatly be appreciated. And also guys, um, anything real fast around the horn uh, as far as, well, you want to promote Paul? I, I saw on Comicsology, and I had to buy it. They had uh, reprinted 
a Spectre Doctor 13 story that you did in Ghosts. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feature, but they yeah. had all three parts in one issue. And oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I did uh, I, I did uh, Doctor 13 back up in Ghosts for a while, and, and I did a Spectre three-parter. Uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of that stuff is up on uh, on Comicsology. Uh, the thing I've got now is is this, which is Paul Kupperberg's Illustrated Guide to Writing Comics. Excellent. You're a surefire yeah. way to become a pro. No, it's um, <laughs> it's just stuff I learned. You know, it's been doing it for 45 years, and uh, you know, my feeling is that you know, there's there's no one way to write comic books, but there is you know, there are a series of steps that you need to learn along the way. So that's what I'm hoping to to impart with this. Excellent. Can I promote something? Please, Jerry. Power Shazam, the first uh, hardcover comes out on Wednesday or Tuesday. Cool. And then the following week, the first hardcover Man of Steel collection um, comes out. And that includes some of the stories that uh, Marv Wolfman and I did, including, you know, John Burns' uh, Man of Steel miniser miniseries and his, you know, Superman number one or whatever. It's they, they're, they're nice collections. They collect about maybe a little more than 13 issues worth or 14 issues worth of uh, material. So they're not unwieldy like a omnibus, but uh, hopefully people will, uh, will, you know, buy those. <laughs> Excellent. We're up against the clock guys. So real fast, uh, Elliot. Um, I've been, I've been you know. writing books. I've been writing about a book a year. Here's the last one. It's called not my closet. It's about my closet. Don't fly under their own power. First time I ever tried to write one like that. It took me years. It was really hard, but uh, I'm going to try to turn out one a year. This year, I slip because I'm hibernating. <laughs> I understand. I get up in the morning and I can do one thing. This is my thing for today. <laughs> well, I look forward to our next conversation about that. Dan, any quick? Uh... Uh, Batman Beyond and Nightwing, which I am both writing, and Detective Comics 1027, where I have a story that I wrote and drew. That's beautiful. Guys, thank you so much. I'm going to make a quick goodbye. Really appreciate it. I'll be talking to the Justice League animated cast at uh, 5.30 Eastern. But until then, thank you very much. And I apologies for the next panel. But take care, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. And guys, thank you for participating. Thank you. Bye.